Thank you. Thank you. So, or stand, or at least quiet down. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome this second session is on mental imagery. It's going to run from 1.30 to 4 p.m. And because of the nature of the auditorium and the large group, we can't take any formal breaks in that time. I know it's a pretty long time. So what we're going to just ask you to do is take your own stretch breaks and do what you need to do to be comfortable, but we are going to just simply proceed to use that two and a half hours uh, straight through. I wanted to make a program correction. You'll, some of you may have noticed that John Duncan was in the program to be a panelist in the attention session. He unfortunately was not able to come, and so that is why you didn't hear him engaging uh, with the rest of the panelists this morning. Um, and we're sorry for that. We're going to follow the same format as the attention session. We have a little bit more time because we don't have the front piece uh, material that we had to that, that we had in in the morning. Uh, we'll have two speakers: Stephen Coslin, who is the John Lindsay oh, Professor of Psychology at Harvard University, and Matthew Ricard who is a Buddhist monk at the Shechen Monastery. Our distinguished panelists uh, in this session are Nancy Canwisher, who you remember from the morning from the attention session from MIT, Dan Reesberg, who is a professor of psychology at Reed College, Marlene Berman, who is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh, and Alan Wallace, who is now shifting over from being a presenter to being a panelist, uh, who is at the Santa Barbara Institute. And of course, His Holiness, who is a, on every panel, uh, <laughs> the course of this, of the course of this weekend. Uh, I want to just say one other thing. You notice that when the speakers were presenting in the morning that occasionally they had to stop because there were issues of translation. The, pan, the, the speakers were told at the same time that they only had 20 minutes in which to present. And this has caused some consternation because we want, of course, to make sure that His Holiness is following everything. So what we're going to do is relax a little bit about the time frame, give people enough time so that they can say what they need to say and His Holiness can follow along. Um, and it's better that we get it right than that we get it fast. Uh, we won't, so we may, these, the, these present presentations may go some more in the order of 25 to 27 minutes rather than 20. And I think that's all by way of just um, sort of housekeeping. I think we should get started and we are going to begin this time with the Buddhist perspective. So Matthew, here to my left, will start us off. We are going to explain a few uh, things about how mental imagery is being used as part of uh, an effort of personal transformation. So may we may wonder why we should spend so much time uh, trying to visualize, represent some images. And uh, so for that, we need to place it in a little bit of vaster perspective because it has to do with a kind of transformation of the way we perceive the phenomenal world from one side, and the way we also consider the nature of the perceiver, that is what is supposed to be the eye of the subject. And why do we need at all to transform that? What is wrong with the way we ordinarily perceive the world? And so usually, when we do perceive the world, we cannot help but assign values, judgment, 
which in some cases, of course, help us to function in this world. If we know something is very hot, we need to be careful about it, know that it's kind of dangerous and sort of take one's distance. But that process quickly sort of solidifies. And we start assigning, imputing characteristics to outer objects which we feel are intrinsic to those. We might think that this flower is beautiful because we perceive it as such. But very quickly, we tend to believe that this is intrinsically beautiful or ugly. And that sounds are intrinsically pleasant or unpleasant, and so for taste, so for touch, and for all our sensory experiences. So in fact, which is a deeply interdependent process of we perceive things and assign values and try to attract and possess things or discard things, we start to believe that this belongs, those characteristics belong to these objects. And because of that, it becomes a much strong uh, compulsion to either possess them or attract them or repulse them. The problem with this is that quickly this craving or repulsion uh, turns out to be at odds with reality. Things are not intrinsically beautiful or pleasant, so are sound, taste, or touch, or whatever. And so because of that, there is this inadequation between our perception and reality ends up in a sense of frustration, torment, inner conflict, and in the end, suffering. Likewise, for the perceiver, we know that we change, our body change from being a baby to an adult and elderly person. We know that our experience of the mind at every moment is something new, but we can't help thinking that in that stream of in constant transformation, that there is something within that, a kind of core, like the I, which defines us, which is really us, and which continues in a unitary way throughout this process. That is our instinctive belief. And so once we have this core identification of an I, then obviously we want to protect it. We want to please it. There is a sense of fear or rejection or attraction connected with that strong sense of self-importance that comes out of it. And that sense of self-importance connected with that feeling that there is a core agent of perceiver also provides a target for being very vulnerable to all kinds of impression, relation with others, and from there comes intense craving, comes hatred, pride, contempt, jealousy. Jealousy, for instance, could not be there at all without a sense of target of self-importance. So in Buddhist term, we call that a deluded perception, because we are solidifying both the inner reality of the, the stream of consciousness, which is constantly changing, as well as the flow of ever-changing phenomena outside by imputing, superimposing categories, like and dislike, to a much excessive extent that actually makes us function in a way that makes us, at, in the end, uh, end up in torment and suffering and self-centered and self-importance, giving a, a tremendous importance to self-importance and the self. And so the whole idea of the Buddhist part, which is in the end to acknowledge, recognize suffering for what it is. That's what we say, that what's wrong with our way of perceiving the phenomenal world. It's just wrong in the sense that it ends up in suffering or torments. And also that torments prevent us from being open to others and express our choices. So in that sense, we call that deluded perception. And so if we could remedy to that, it is definitely a step towards uh, understanding the true nature of reality, not clinging to it as something solid, recognizing the illusory nature of that perceiver, which we believe to be a unitary, distinct entity within, 
And instead of losing one's identity, what one wins is actually inner freedom in one's relation to phenomena and in one's relation with the stream of our thoughts. So it is within that background that one will use uh, mental imagery. And why is that so? It's a kind of skillful means to replace this uh, sort of impure, deluded perception of the phenomenal world, attaching strong characteristics that belongs to the object with a much more uh, flowing attitude that is more attuned to the, the nature of the stream of consciousness that is ever changing. And it also has to do, in a second way, with uh, a viewpoint of the, what is the, the nature of mind related to destructive and obscuring emotions. From Buddhist perspective, we believe that when we look deep within the mind, if we come to a perception of just pure consciousness, the stream, we sometimes call it luminosity, the mere fact that we are able to have a cognitive faculty, just a pure cognitive faculty without mental construct, without images. So we believe that that is not doesn't contain, interestingly, anger and uh, jealousy, pride, contempt, disgust, all those mental factors that just evolve out of that, out of our grasping and of deluded way to perceive reality. So that the process of gaining freedom from frustration and torment also requires that we become more aware of that basic nature of consciousness from the, uh, from the in introspective way, and so that we can somehow be free from those obscuring emotion that arises out of this mere faculty or cognitive faculty. So those two aspects will be addressed in the way we use mental imagery. And why is that so? Because when we are thus attached to, in different ways, to the phenomenal world and to ourselves and uh, to our ways of relating to others, uh, we have a perception of our body, our name, our mind, uh, different things that we believe characterize the person or the I. And so we have been functioning like that for a long time. So now what we're trying to do here is to try to generate mental images which in one way are going to remind us or bring us closer from what we believe is the true nature of mind. So for that we will use symbolic images. For instance, we have two harms. And those harms we use for different things, to play badminton or other things. And that's great, but that doesn't lead us very much anywhere. Now, we see in some of the images that are visualized, that's what we, the word we use for mental imagery, to visualize oneself as a particular deity or representation, which has a very profound meaning that's going to help us to attune to our true nature. So we'll have things which seems very strange, with four arms or six arms, three heads. But then, what's the idea behind that? Is that instead of following constantly a deluded process of chaining of thoughts, one thought of attraction or repulsion giving rise to a second one, a third one, and soon the mind being completely invaded with kind of disturbing thoughts or thoughts of hatred or whatever. And so we become the slave of our own thoughts. So rather than that, we will harness this constant movement of the minds and put it to something that will slowly bring us back to what is basically more our true nature. And so there will be a try to remember and focus on the meaning of a ourselves visualized in a certain form which has meanings. For instance, for two arms will represent the wisdom or understanding of reality, and the other arm will be compassion, the expression of wisdom. If we have four arms, that will symbolize boundless love, boundless compassion, boundless rejoicing, and boundless equanimity. 
if we have visualized in form of six arms, that will be the perfection of discipline, generosity, diligence, concentration, and wisdom, and patience. And so likewise, like three, three heads might represent the transformation of the three main mental toxins, such as hatred, craving, and uh, uh, lack of discernment or mental uh, delusion. And so rather than, and then we will do so for ourselves, we'll do so for other beings, we'll do so for our environment. So in, in a way that seems somehow artificial, we are trying to transform our perception of the world from a deluded way to something that always reminds us of the basic quality of pure awareness when it is free from those obscuring emotions. So now, of course, we are so used to function in a way that we do perceive solid characteristics in objects. We do perceive an eye as the perceiver, as something solid and lasting. That's our intuitive perception. We are a little bit like a, a piece of paper which has been rolled for a long time. And so if even you try to put it flat on a table and lift your hand, it was going to roll up again. That's what we call mental tendencies. So we are used to see the world in this kind of solid way. So now it will also take time to replace that with a more free uh, perception that takes in account interdependence, ultimate nature of reality, and the true nature of mind. So in that context, one will use mental imagery. And so we need to go to then a systematic training. So we might, for instance, take as object of our concentration or mental imagery an image of a Buddha, for instance, or any other deity with uh, different symbols, numbers of arms, heads, and so forth. Initially, one will train the attention, looking very carefully at the details of that image, and then without having to have to attend to that image, one will try to recreate it within. And this is something that we will cultivate to a great extent. We may, for instance, over several weeks of training, all day, spend a whole session concentrating on the shape of the eyes, just the black and the white and the design, the, beautiful proportion of the eye as we see on the represent of the Buddha. We may spend three hours just on the eyes. Likewise on the mouth. Likewise on the oval of the, of the, of the, of the face. And if it's a more complex representation than the Buddha Shakyamuni, like a deity with different arms and heads and so forth, ornaments, likewise we will spend a whole session on the particular set of ornaments or clothing, and go one by one from the top to the bottom, bottom to the top, spending enough time on each detail. We'll also get used to bring back the mind when the mind is going to wander, because obviously when one tries to do that, like any um, object of attention as was described this morning, there will be two ways that when we lose uh, the attention on what one is trying to visualize. Either the mind will be utterly distracted, and then we try to bring it back, just a little bit like a butterfly that comes out of the flower and comes back to it. Try to be aware that one has wandered, try to bring it back. In the same way, we may lose the visualization because it becomes dim, unclear, and then we sink in kind of torpor or sort of lassitude and tiredness. And so, in each case, there are ways to bring back the attention, or to revive the attention, or to take a rest so that we come back to it. But we will repeat those processes again and again. So after a while, the image will become more clear, and when we have become familiar with each and every detail of the representation, then we can start to form a more global image of the what we are trying to visualize, the Buddha or a deity or whatever else. And then it says that uh, what we need to achieve step by step, there are three aspects. One is clarity in the sense of precision, trying to see the most minute detail. And to enhance that, one will use different methods. Sometimes, for instance, 
instead of visualizing the deity just as our own body with the same size, we might visualize it big as a mountain and then walk through the details of the visualization as if we were like a deer on that mountain, going to the eyes, again, looking at all the details, going all the details of the, of the body, of the shape, of the ornaments, of the clothing, so that we become more and more familiar. Or we may do just the opposite. Try to keep the visualization very clear, yet make it the whole thing as small as a sesame seed and still mentally try to re retain all the details. So we just exercise in many different ways, also letting the deity move and go around, look from different perspectives, and so until we have a sort of clear perception. The second characteristics or, or training we try to achieve is to be, because just visualizing in itself doesn't lead much anywhere, is to precisely be all at all times aware of the meaning of what one is visualizing. Once again, for instance, the two harms being wisdom and compassion and so forth. So that slowly, what comes in our mind, the usual stream of deluded thoughts, the different kinds of the afflicting emotions will be replaced by those qualities. It's based on a very simple uh, observation. You cannot at the same time, in the same instant, shake someone's hand or beat that person. This is in the, you can do it in two different gestures, but not in the same time. So likewise, two, at the same moment, towards the same object. You cannot feel hatred or love. You can alternate, but not in the very same moment. So the more the mind will be sort of occupied or nurture uh, thoughts such as altruism and patience, inner peace, and so forth, the less the antidote, such as uh, hatred, animosity, craving, and uh, jealousy, and so forth, will have space in your mind. So remembering the symbolism is one of the second aspects of which we attach to the meaning of mental imagery. And then a third aspect is to somehow, through that, rediscover one's true nature in the sense that if we come through the visualization to realize that precisely those craving we have for things as being or clinging we have to other objects as being either beautiful or ugly, pleasant or unpleasant, are more like projection of our mind. They don't truly exist in the object. And so we get a much more inner freedom relating to the phenomenal world. Likewise, visualizing oneself as a deity, not as me, this French monk, with a big nose and a big belly, that didn't help me to visualize myself for 58 years. <laughs> I got nowhere. <laughs> now, if I start for a few months to visualize myself as the Buddha Shakyamuni, it really helps me a little bit to improve. <laughs> so that idea, we call that a kind of a wisdom pride. Not that we are proud of not being the Buddha and things, that's, that's great, but simply that we sort of have a confidence that somehow through this, we are rediscovering the true nature of our mind that is free from obscuring emotion. And that is the only way to achieve genuine inner peace and inner happiness. So that confidence contrasts a lot with the usual torments from hopes and fears and expectation that takes place when we precisely put all our hopes outside, thinking that if I arrange the outer world in this way, I'm going to be really happy. Or when things go wrong, if I can manipulate the outer world in this way, I'm going to remove my suffering, not looking at the inner conditions, which has to do with the, the state of our mind. So then, in a way, so when we begin such kind of uh, visualization or mental imagery, we first dissolve into light and emptiness, our ordinary body, and, re and we think that the nature of our mind arises as this image we're trying to visualize. So in that way, it helps us to rediscover our true nature. We're not trying to make reality even more complicated, more artificial. It's just a, a trick, a skillful means to, recover, to rediscover our true nature. So now, what, uh, how does the experiences of stabilizing 
and making the image more and more clear. How is it described by great contemplatives? They say, in the first place, this is just a mental construct. You build up the visualization step by step, and you would do that, say, if you, if you do it in a, in a quiet situation, you might do that four sessions a day, each one three hours. So that's really a strong involvement in trying to generate those images with all the meaning which has been described. So in the beginning, it is definitely a mental construct. You have to do it again and again and try to get a stable image. At the same time, you're not trying to visualize something solid because that's what you want to get rid of. So you more see the the image as something like made of light, like a rainbow, which is very, very clear. At the same time, it's not made of flesh and blood or wood or stone. It's not also like a rainbow which is completely inert. It has quality of wisdom, of compassion, so it reminds you and inspires you to let flourish all these inner qualities within our mind, your mind. So it is artificial for a long time. But it says that when the contemplative gain some kind of mastery, precisely as we was described this morning, it becomes effortless. And that's when we say that the visualization now arises to the sense organs. That means without effort. It says some meditators, when they think of the image of the Buddha or some other deity, it just comes almost like a visual object, although they clearly know it's in their mind. It comes complete with all its clarity, all its vividness, all its stability, just like a fish leaping out of water, which is complete and clear, and you don't have, at least from your perception, to recompose each time the, all the details and reassemble a global image. It has become something which is more natural and easy and effortless. And it says at a later stage, it can appear without any need for a mental effort or trying to visualize it simply sort of appeared there. And you might say it's a kind of conditioning. Now you sort of fabricate that image that just pops up there and you're sort of powerless to control it. One of the important points of this kind of uh, training is also just in the same way that you are able to have a clear, totally vivid image you should be able also to let it vanish and disappear in the same way without leaving any traces. And so it's really helping one to achieve a very uh, profound mastery of the workings of the mind. And so, of course, some people have described people having visions, things that appear very clearly like I heard of somebody when there was a stimulation in the brain, he thought that his dog was in the room. And he said, don't let the dog come in the operating theater. And the body said, dog is not there. But apparently that person saw the dog just as I see this spot of uh, flowers. But the thing here that those things happen as a result of training in people whose mind is actually extremely healthy, who by any other consideration are very stable, very peaceful, very open to others. And so it's quite different in a way uh, of a different pathological state in which some of those images may appear very clearly. So the benefit of this, of this training, of this stabilization of mental images, is actually not that you become caught in this content in a movie trying to make 3D, uh, you know, looking at Buddha fields and things like that. It's more that actually it becomes, it comes with a result of inner freedom. In the sense that one is no more attached to phenomenal world as being so solid as before, attributing and superimposing all those qualities of pleasant, unpleasant, ugly, or disgusting, and so forth. One is much more greater inner freedom in relation to the perceiver, not believing that this is I. Matthew was perceiving all that, and I have been perceiving those kind of things since so many years. But more you realize the interdependence between the stream of consciousness, which is like a river, but without the boat of the ego in it. And in interdependence with the ceaselessly changing phenomena or relations between all phenomena, which we normally solidify as separate objects. So that is the inner freedom. 
and all the frustrations and torments that comes from solidifying the outer world and solidifying the perceiver also disappear. It is not that you become like a vegetable, indifference to anything. It's more that you are no more caught into those attraction and repulsion that precisely comes from a wrong perception of reality. Freedom from torments means inner peace, which is found from within, which is quite different from seeking happiness and peace depending upon outer phenomena, pleasure, sensation, and so forth. And that sense of inner peace naturally comes with much more openness to the world and other sentient beings. The lack of fear, the lack of self-importance, self-identity naturally flourish with a greater altruism, compassion, loving kindness, because the barriers between self and others has been removed. So it's, it may seem very odd to spend six months or more trying to visualize in a very complex way. And when I gave the example of a single deity, there are so-called mandalas, I mean the assembly of all the deities that one visualizes, that includes like more than 700 deities. And they are definitely meditators who can one by one go in their mind and visualize in detail those 700 deities. So that shows the kind of capacity that you can develop. And of course, this is like a ladder. Once you have climbed to the roof with the ladder, you don't need to take the ladder on your back. So those are extremely profound and efficient techniques for transforming yourself. But eventually, what it leads to is to understand the nature, the deep nature of your mind, that pure awareness or that pure consciousness that is free from obscuring emotions. And that, when this is understood, and when thought and emotion arises, you are much more free and well equipped to do so that they do come to your mind, but they are not going to invade your mind so that you make you their slaves. And so that's one of the secrets of genuine and lasting happiness. Thank you. Okay, there we go. It's Good. okay, Steve. Okay. Um, yeah. That better? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about introspection and mechanism and mental imagery. And let me start off by pointing out that I have to be extremely humble. Um, that was a fantastic talk we just heard, and it reminded me of how little we know in the scientific community, just how narrow and focused we've been. Hopefully, we're starting to build a brick that can contribute to the wall, but we really must be modest. So with that preface, um, let me talk about what we've discovered. Thank you. Um, I, thank you. Um, about visual mental images in particular uh, from laboratory studies. So when I say visual mental image, what I mean is a representation, so something actually in the head, that produces the experience, so there's a linkage between something in the head and the conscious experience of seeing in the absence of the usual sensory input. So if you close your eyes and visualize. Uh, imagery is imp an important part of mental life, for example, and there are many other examples, it plays roles in memory, reasoning, creativity, planning, emotion, pain control. Many of these things were touched on in Matthew's talk. Uh, to experience the role of imagery in memory retrieval, let me just focus on one, the one on the top. Uh, please try to answer these questions. Do you know what shape a cat's ears are? Yeah, I'm just... 
Yeah, it's a jungle dust or different kinds. <laughs> which, which species of cat? Which species of cat? <laughs> a house cat. <laughs> you can visualize you know, um, the image of the cat's head with a little bit of fur comes to his mind. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, do the ears... I think mostly I think more, more peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. This is a very American eccentric. In which hand does the Statue of Liberty hold the torch? <laughs> Which is darker green, lettuce or spinach? So lettuce is like in a salad. It's Jangunane, Sondonina, and Dingin, and the Kaganagayores. She would be spinach tea than the Palakiva. Pets it up. She would eat nice. She would eat. You don't eat spinach? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> okay. Um, those of you in the audience, would you raise your hand if when you tried to answer the question about the shape of the cat's ears, you visualize the animal's head? Would you mind letting us know if you actually had that experience? Okay, did you visualize the Statue of Liberty in order to answer the question? All right, what about the darker green lettuce or? Okay, so most people get a sense of what I mean by introspection and mental imagery from, in its use in memory retrieval by trying to answer these questions. Introspection, as I use that term. Did, did you have it also? Did you, do you also have the experience of? Visualizing? Yeah. Is was saying that you're drawing from past experience? Yes. Um, introspection, which I've just been trying to demonstrate, is the act of looking within. So I think you use the term the same way. Now, introspections vary um, and need not directly reveal how the mind works. So some people may introspect that they're looking at the shape of the ears, other people may not. How do you verify what's really going on in the mind? So we try to externalize introspections. That we make the subjective objective. That's the goal. That's the goal. The introspection is the low number of children that died. That the children don't touch the children. That they are called objects. So they tell you how to do it. So the three parts, and I'm briefly going to do this, um, I'm addressing, again, this issue of introspection and what it tells us about the nature of the mind. So there are three conditions. It succeeds, by which I mean that introspection actually does reveal the workings of the mind. It misleads and actually is silent. It fails. It doesn't tell you anything. So let me go through some examples of each, first starting with cases where introspection succeeds. So we'll look at four examples. First, uh, mental rotation. So if you see this letter R, does that face normally or is it mirror imaged, mirror reversed? So independent of how it's tilted, yeah. is it facing the way the letter usually faces or is it a mirror image facing to the left instead of to the right? It's just slightly slanted. Right. Okay, now what about this one? What's up with you, sir? It's down. What? So in order to answer this question, you probably mentally rotate. You imagine it literally moving around until it's upright. That's mental rotation. Introspectively, it feels as if we rotate something in our minds. Well, Roger Shepard and his colleagues have done a whole host of studies on this, including looking at three-dimensional cases. So the question here is, are these identical, or is one a mirror image of the other, independently of how they're oriented? So could you rotate one so its incongruence lays right on top of the other, or are they mirror images? Mm -hmm. 
So what we find is the further they have to scan, that is the further apart the objects were, the longer it takes them. Just like the introspection suggests, there's, when you visualize something, it's as if something's in space that you can scan mm. I think I'm going to skip this one, just for an interest of time. Uh, recombination. Okay, try this, please. Visualize an uppercase letter D. Uppercase. D, the capital knowledge. Now, mentally rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise. So the straight line is on the bottom. Then, now visualize an uppercase letter J placed under the rotated D so that the top of the J touches the midpoint of the straight side of the D. That. 
Okay, does it seem to resemble an object you've seen? Can you see an umbrella? <laughs> so, introspectively, we can not only rotate images, we can move them and recombine and form new shapes and make new discoveries. So these are cases where introspection succeeds in indicating how information processing how the mind, the mechanism is working. Now let's talk about the Introspection is not always so effective. It sometimes misleads us. So let's talk about cases. So there are two sorts of misleading introspections, and I think this is the most interesting case, actually. Um, one, although the initial introspection can be misleading, a person, one, can be trained to notice such difficulties. So our studies have shown, in some cases, you can correct. In contrast, training cannot correct introspections about other properties of imagery we claim. Let's take a look at some examples. So first, we'll consider cases where initial introspections can be misleading, but you can be trained. So introspectively, images seem to be mental pictures, but they aren't actually pictures. So unlike pictures, objects of mental images, one, they're pre-interpreted, and thus difficult to reinterpret. Can you explain pre -interpret? I'm going to show. I'm going to show an example. So two, they have an internal organization that limits how they can be used. Three, they're often incomplete or inaccurate. Let's go through these one at a time. So they're pre-interpreted and difficult to reinterpret. So image reinterpretation is what I mean by that is seeing things in a new light. Take a look at this. That's a duck. You see the duck? OK. Visualize what you just saw and look again. Could that figure have been something else? How about a rabbit? You see? See, if you make the face up there, and what was the beak now becomes the ears, you reinterpret it. It's extremely difficult to do in mental imagery, as Daniel, Dan Riesberg has shown. So image reinterpretation is hard. You can learn to do it. it. It largely depends on your attention, what you choose to pay attention to. And with hints, people can be taught how to reinterpret images. But it's something that's difficult at the beginning. Another reason it's difficult is images have an internal organization that limits how they can be used. So let me give you an example. Can you visualize this figure? OK. Can you see two overlapping triangles? in that image? Um, Two triangles. <laughs> OK. That's relatively easy. How about a parallelogram? So that's what I mean by parallelogram. Can you see a parallelogram in that figure? In that figure? Yeah. And that figure, you can see two in it. That's the camera. It's a little bit of a camera. It's a See, it's hard. It's difficult. The reason is that you stored it as two overlapping triangles. So it's easy to see the triangle. But to see the parallelogram, you have to cross over the different units and reorganize it. It has an intrinsic organization. It's difficult to break up that organization. Finally, unlike pictures, objects and mental images, they're often incomplete or inaccurate. And you often don't notice that they're incomplete or inaccurate. So images seem like pictures because we pay attention to the characteristics we generate. They're often fragmentary and incomplete. For example, visualize a horse. What shape are its rear knees, its back knees? So the back legs, what shape are its knees? You know? 
Depends on how you how familiar you are with horses. That's right. Most people get this wrong. They think that the back legs of a horse look like a human's legs. And you can see they don't. Their images are inaccurate. Or sometimes they just leave the legs out. <laughs> So two sorts of misleading introspections. We've been focusing on the case where the initial introspections can be misleading, but you can be trained to notice differences, difficulties, these cases. Now let's consider misleading introspections where you can't be trained, at least we haven't succeeded. Image generation. Image generation is the act of producing a short-term memory, by that I mean a conscious image, on the basis of information stored in long-term memory. Mm. So when I asked you about the cat's ears, you had stored information in long-term memory, and until I asked you about it, you didn't generate the image. The image is what you experience, not what's stored, stored in long-term memory. So image generation is the process. No. So Mathieu mentioned no. that there's training, building up images a part at a time. That's image generation. Mm. So visualize the uppercase letters of the alphabet, one by one, so A, B, C. Does each letter seem to spring to mind all at once, all in one piece? Does? Then A, B, C, D, then you can make a chip in us. And A is like you can talk to the tips in Lord Chaguna, and those take the tips or Lord Chaguna's. Total Lord Chaguna. Total Lord Chaguna. Total Lord Chaguna. One at a time. Good. Introspectively, images seem to appear all at once. Like you see the letter A, A, B, B. But it's not true. They are actually built up apart at a time. Even with things like letters, where you're extremely practiced in Western culture. So here's a way we do some of these experiments. Here's a perception version where you actually see it. So in perception, you see there's a grid, a four by five grid, and in it is an uppercase letter F. So the F is this gray F. form that's been filled in oh. by filling in some of the cells. The task is simply to tell us whether the X mark falls on the F like it does here or is next to it in an empty cell. Then the X, the F, the the There's the X. In this case, the X is on it. If it were here, it would be off. Off. Those kids take what is called X letter. The F comma to, and the two should not be on those. Dangerous. Here it is on top. Yeah. Yeah. This is not imagery. This is perception. You're actually seeing it. Here's the way we do the imagery case. We have you memorized letters in four by five grids. So you can see A. There's the F, one down from the top, and L, and so forth. Notice the letters have different numbers of segments. So L has two, F has three, and so on. In the imagery experiment, we present you a lowercase letter, which looks nothing like the uppercase, under an empty grid, four by five. Well, it contains, it's not quite empty. It contains one X. The question is, if the corresponding uppercase letter were in that grid, would it cover the X mark? Yes or no? That's a G or F? That's an F. They've, they've learned the font. And oh. the, it, so would it out there? And then you get the X, you get the size of the table, the table in those kids' tigores. And then the charge of F, the F chair. Oh, they're showing we F there. F there. So would it cover it? Oh, I see, yes, cover. OK, good. So. The, the letters have different numbers of segments. What you find is the time to make that decision depends on the number of segments. So for example, L has two segments, and is more rapidly visualized than F, which has three segments. So here are the data. There are the number of segments. You see when it goes from two up to five. For perception, it makes no difference when you actually see the letters in front of you. But for imagery, the more segments, the more time it takes. Moreover, it depends where the X is. You, li you literally draw them in the order that you would print the, the, the segments. So you're faster if the X is along the vertical. Next here, 
completely invisible to introspection, even after you've done the experiment many times. Last part, when introspection fails. Introspection does not reveal the mechanisms that underlie imagery. So two examples, imagery and perception, types of imagery. Let's do imagery and perception. So here's the exper experiment. People um, were either shown drawings of simple, simple line drawings of common objects like a guitar and an anchor um, very dimly um, on a screen when they're in an MRI machine. Their brains are being scanned. Um, they see it and they hear a question like, is the right side higher than the left? Actually, they just hear right higher, but they, they've been taught what that means. So for the guitar, the answer would be no, because the left side is higher than the right side in that drawing. For the anchor, the answer would be yes. Okay? So they see one drawing at a time, and it's very dim, and they make a decision about its shape. Which make, we do that so that they have to pay attention to it and look at the picture. Another condition. This is perception. We actually see them one at a time. The other condition is we have them memorize another set of pictures. Of course, half the people get one set for perception and one for imagery. It's balanced. We have to memorize them. And in the scanner, they hear the name only, like guitar. And they have their eyes closed. And they have to visualize that drawing. And then they hear right side higher and they make the same judgment. So when you average over people, it's the identical images that are either have been a perception where they see it or an imagery with their eyes closed and identical questions. And here's what's going on in the brain. So let me explain the way this works. On um, the very top row, you'll see on the left is perception data, on the right is imagery, and on, sorry, the middle is imagery, and the far right is what's more activated in perception than imagery. So it's correction. Somebody, and what we've got on the first row is right behind the whole forehead. So a slice right here. Mm -hmm. And the next one down is a little bit further back. We're going like this, sort of like a piece of salami that you cut, mm -hmm. not, not, sort of. So as you, as you go down, you're going back further in the brain. Now here's what's interesting. Look back and forth between the corresponding pairs of perception imagery. And then look at the difference on the right. There is no difference. What's the third one? That's the difference. This is what's more activated by perception than imagery. We subtract this from that, the imagery from perception. So I'm just trying to show you that for the front half of the brain, it's virtually identical what's going on when you're visualizing with your eyes closed. It's virtually identical for the front half. So the front half of the brain, so the eye, the eye would be over there, is virtually identical what it's doing with your eyes closed and you're visualizing, and your eyes open and you're looking. Now look at the back half of the brain. So this is the study I did with George O'Ganis. Um, now compare again perception and imagery. Look on the far right. As you go down, you can see that there's starting to be color here. The reason why is the back half of the brain is being more activated by perception than by imagery. But, and here's a really important point, Every single part of the brain that's activated by imagery is in a location that was activated by perception. So imagery is activated in the same parts, just more weakly. So when you close your eyes and visualize, the same mechanisms, looks like for almost certainly identical in the front part of the brain, and very, very similar in the back part of the brain, are being activated when you see and when you visualize. Here's the important part. Here's an important part. Because it shares... Because it shares neural machinery with perception, imagery inherits specific characteristics. That is, what the parts of the brain are doing during perception, they're kind of, we're kind of stuck with that during imagery. For example, in perception, images should not linger. 
When you move your head or you move your eyes, you don't want smearing. This property of the mechanisms makes mental images difficult to maintain. They fade quickly. Um, so I first became interested in Buddhist practice, and so far as, as I am from the perspective of the scientist, because I heard that your training can result in people being able to maintain images for 20 minutes. And at least according to my understanding of how the brain works, that should not be possible. <laughs> so, so if you are right, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean any disrespect, that if, if you are right, it's extremely important for science. And Ms. Solens was saying that, well, according to that, then it's even worse because the claim is that one will be able to maintain one sixth of 24 hours. 24 hours, that's that fall, fall, so. <laughs> okay. So that's even more damaging to my theory. Um, okay, finally, types of imagery. So, last, last part. So, his holiness is wondering, since there is such close kind of parallel, the, yeah. at least in the brain area between what happens, uh, the, 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 the locus of brain that is activated during actual perception and the image, imagery, imagination, what about dreams? Because the experience seems to be so similar. Can we defer that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> a very good question. It's a very good question. I'll make sure we get back. Okay. Neuro, so last, last little bit. Uh, His Holiness is wondering whether, in terms of people's capacity for imagination, uh, is there a difference between people's eyesight, some who have better eyesight and some less? Uh, we've looked at that. <laughs> um, it looks like it depends on how old you were uh -huh. when you first needed glasses. Uh, I have a student who's tested hundreds of people and there's a small correlation uh, with objective tests of imagery vividness. Um, the way you think. Um, but we, that's still work in progress, so we'll see, but it's, it's the right kind of question. So, it's conceivable that some people, because of poor eyesight, you know, the perception may not be vivid and strong, but because of the past experience and memory, they could have very vivid imagination. Similarly, there could be people who have very good eyesight, but very poor capacity for I think that's imagination. I think it's exactly right. I think it depends on what age, certainly with the blind who we have studied, mm. it depends on what age you were when you mm. had the problem. Um, but the last part of this piece is, uh, so these are cases we're talking about where introspection simply fails to tell you what's going on. Introspection doesn't tell you that the front part of your brain, which is where you're doing a lot of this control sorts of things that Jonathan Cohen talked about, is doing the identical as far as we can tell, action and imagery and perception. It doesn't tell you that the back part of your brain is being driven more strongly by perception, imagery is weaker. Types of imagery, last part, I think this is important. Neuroscientists distinguish among mental capacities by identifying different brain systems. And these distinctions between different mental capacities as we identify them are not apparent to introspection. The classification of capacities, mental capacities, that emerges from this approach, my approach, produces distinctions that cut across those that are evident to introspection. So, going back to our questions, what shape are a cat's ears? Which hand is Statue of Liberty hold the torch? Which is darker green, lettuce or spinach? Although it's not evident to introspection, shape, spatial, so shape, shape of the animal's ears, for example, spatial, hand of the torch, and color imagery, rely on distinct neural systems. So the shape processing taps particularly part of the inferior temporal complex. Spatial processing, another part. Color, 
get another part. Brain damage can separate these. People can have one ability and the others can be selectively impaired. This is not evident introspection. We don't introspectively know that they're in fact separate systems within imagery, just within imagery. <laughs> But His Holiness has also heard from one of the earlier discussions in Mind and Life that um, you know, in, in cases of uh, patients where certain parts of the brain gets damaged, gradually some other parts of the brain takes over. There's a, some process of recovery, isn't that? The key word is some. Uh, the brain is plastic, less so for adults than children. It depends exactly where the damage. We have an expert on this here, Marlene Berman. So when we get into the discussion, we can talk about the degree to which you get compensation. But in adults, it's, it's unfortunately relatively little. So introspection. The main point is introspection. ね、so we've heard a lot about first person versus third person and the, the value and role of introspection. I just want to point out that introspection reveals the results of mechanisms at work, but not the mechanisms themselves. Yeah. Nevertheless, introspectively revealed results of mechanisms at work do provide important hints, but only hints, about the nature of the mechanisms themselves. So there were three parts of this talk. The first was where introspection succeeds, all of those cases were the results of mechanisms. Rotate, scan, recombine. Didn't tell you about how it actually was working under there. Cases where it misleads. In some examples, you can be trained to notice it misleads because it's where you're tending in the image. It's how you organize the image. Or you've got an incomplete image. You didn't look carefully enough when you memorized it. Other cases of misleading, which seems like a picture, seems to come up at once. It's not true. It comes up a part at a time, but introspectively, it seems like it comes up at once. Finally, introspection simply fails. It's silent about the nature of the mechanisms, about how the brain is working, and about the organization of the systems that give rise to imagery. So I wanted to end with some questions for practitioners. Um, we can start the discussion with these, um, or I can present them now. What would you prefer? You can read them, yeah. So these are, these are questions that I personally, speaking as a scientist who studies imagery, would love to discuss with practitioners. One is, how does Buddhist practice alter introspection? Make you better. The origins of scientific psychology began with Wundt, who trained introspection. Does meditation improve imagery abilities? Can introspection occur without imagery? For me, the answer is no, but Matthew tells me there is such a thing as pure awareness, where you, you have no imagery, but you're aware. I'd like to know more about what that is. Um, what are recognized obstacles to training via imagery? What methods have you evolved to overcome these obstacles in training? All of these would be very useful for us to, to learn about in guiding our research. Thank you very much for listening to this. I'm going, I'm going to suggest that we move right into the conversation since His Holiness has already begun speaking so we can bring people in and of course Your Holiness as well. And I'm going to also suggest that we start with the most provocative, as I see it, of the questions on the table, which I had written down as something to bring up if it if Steve didn't or someone else didn't, and it's the pure awareness issue. And the issue of luminosity, I was struck that here you were addressing a concept that I felt had no particular um, correlate or analog in the Western tradition, and I want to, and Steve has just said, he has no idea how to handle this. Is there any way in principle that brain science or cognitive science could begin to engage with the Buddhist side on this fundamental issue? 
it's a difficult. Look, the low city is Nancy, yeah. but the difficulty is. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And then we'll move to the. We we'll would just uh, allude to it, but I think if we start with an example. Thank you. You know, to have images, you need a mirror. And the mirror has the faculty to reflect the images. But uh, there's no images in the mirror itself, or in the stain of the mirror. So without the mirror, you can't have images. But you can conceive you can have a uh, mirror without images. So it is a little bit like that. You can't have any kind of thought without the bare, the, the, the bare cognitive faculty. But usually, when our mind functions, it's always related to some object, memory, imagination, perception, and so forth. Because that's where we function. And it's simply, in fact, because we don't really, we lack this, this, this very simple effort of introspection. Because we are not used to, we are used to perceive things, object, colors, memories, fancies, phantasmas, but we don't really look at the mind itself. And so now, there could be times, even in untrained persons, when there is sort of the thought or image is gone, and there's a short moment before something else arises, and you still are aware, obviously. Mm -hmm. So you could become more aware of that mere awareness. And there could be some times that naturally might become longer, where this is just a mirror. There's just simple awareness without mental construct, without concept, without imagery, and still is definitely there. Is it directly following on this? <coughs> yep. Matthew, can I, can I follow up, please? In your talk, I, I think I heard you say, maybe I misunderstood, that um, when you reach the roof, when you climb a ladder, you don't need to put the ladder on your back and carry it with you. And I think the implication was that imagery was sort of a method that would allow you to reach someplace else, at which point you abandon imagery. Now, there's a long history in Western science of treating imagery as a primitive form of thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I just wondered if that's the way it was regarded in Buddhism. We, don't, we won't call it really that primitive, but, uh, you know, we actually called, we speak of two stages. We call the generation or the development stage, which is to gain the capacity okay. to build up those, those images. Okay. That the mind transformation that it's supposed to bring occurs. That means you stop clinging to reality as solid, to the eye as being this entity. And so the deluded perceptions is replaced by what we call pure phenomena. Pure in the sense that it's undiluted and is in adequation, more in adequation with reality. So now once that goal is achieved, you got rid of delusion, you are no more uh, that much the toy of you know, the wild toy that keeps on invading your mind, and you have a clear recognition of that pure awareness, then you don't have, that's it, you, know? you don't need to continue to uh, use the, the ladder that much. But of course, this is just the, the ultimate goal, but until, until then, then you need all the tools. Mathieu, if I understand you correctly, you're suggesting that there are certain important privileges with this pure awareness. And I'm reminded here of um, a chapter in the history of 20th century physics in which um, Einstein and Heisenberg were writing back to each other with Einstein making it clear that in order to do good science, one had to be able to imagine the things that one was doing science on. One had to be able to visualize the, the train moving at light speed with the clock on it and so on through these famous thought experiments. And in response, Heisenberg thought this was the silliest thing imaginable. Um, and clearly, the only way to do good science was to get past these images and to rely on something that I will now loosely call pure awareness, um, although in Heisenberg's case, clearly it was a, a form of awareness that was easily translated into mathematics. But since both of these physicists were massively successful in leading us to great discoveries about the deep nature of the world, it makes me think that one might hesitate to identify one of these or the other as the preferred mode, since the history of the science seems to suggest that both an imagery-based mode of thinking and a mode of thinking that held imagery at arm's length were both effective in their own way. 
Um, yes. There is a good analogy here. Uh, uh, in physics itself, there's a great deal of research in, into the nature of space. And for example, the zero point energy of space, that is, what's there, what kind of energy is there when there is no matter or elect uh, electromagnetic energy that's been in introduced into it. So on the one hand, you just have the study of space, which is certainly a viable, very worthy area of research, and then all the configurations of mass energy that may in fact emerge from space. In a rather similar fashion, in Buddhism we speak of pure awareness. And that is more like space. In fact, space is a very common metaphor for that experience. At the same time, there are the myriad forms that emerge from space. And so it's not so much that one is superior to another, but that, in fact, they are two facets of the same reality. So in Buddhism, we commonly speak of ultimate and conventional or relative reality. But in the final analysis, they are of the same nature. And without pure awareness, you will never have any image, because it's like the mirror. Marlin? Yeah, um, it seems to me that this uh, distinction or this uh, sort of controversy about the existence of pure awareness suggests some really fundamental differences in the way Buddhists have been thinking about imagery and the way that cognitive science um, conceptualizes imagery. So the metaphor of the mirror in the first place um, suggests to me a very kind of passive, sort of reflective process. But in fact, um, I think as has been pointed out here, there's a very much sort of assembly constructivist approach to visual mental imagery. It really is building up the componential components into some kind of unit. So that's one area where I, I seem to see a um, difference from a Buddhist scholar perspective and from the perspective of science, but it kind of permeates into other um, ideas about imagery. So Mathieu uh, told us about how imagery is thought to be um, light, patterns of light without any um, sort of physical substance associated with it, um, a rainbow, um, a kind of diffusion of light. Whereas, again, I think the cognitive science uh, perspective has been uh, of images that have definitive forms, that have s almost physical substance, that are, that are depictions. They aren't pictures, but they are very symbolic, um, isomorphic depictions of the real world. So there seem to be some almost qualitative and quantitative, I think, differences in the way Buddhists think about visual mental imagery and in the kinds of representations that Western scientists think uh, exist in the, uh, in the visual imagery domain. Did you want to respond, or are you? I think that yes, I think that's clear. Yes. We we have some other questions on the table, and some of these were fed to me before the session began by the panelists, and I want to get some of them out on the table also to open up the conversation. Now, more specifically, focusing on aspects of imagery and its trainability, and I think Dan. Uh, you want a question about individual differences and whether there's a, such a concept, perhaps, um, in the Buddhist understanding, or you, you, you take the question, if you would. Sure. Uh, uh, ตอบบ่เลยอยู่ที่ชายบุญอ่ะติดตามกระเพิ่มจะต้องติดจิกเฉยติดบ่จิกเฉยติดคนเรื่องชีวิตย้อนไปชีวิตมาตัวเอ่
for example, like um, uh, imagery is in fact thought to be uh, a content of almost all forms of thought, natural thoughts that occur, and particularly thoughts that uh, engage uh, following a sensory experience. So if you see something and then you imagine uh, what you see with your closed eyes, that's a thought process that follows after a, a sensory experience. So to all of these levels of thought, <laughs> you don't have to close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, while, while you are seeing something, but no pay attention, pay attention only to the, the image. The image, image. Sure. No. Mm -hmm. Then, eventually, automatically, the sort of active role of eye consciousness diminishes. No, can diminish. Mm. Mm. However, um, there is an understanding in the contemplative tradition that uh, this mental imagery that everybody experiences, you know, when you, have, when you experience thought, um, um, the, the, <laughs> the technical term is generic image, so um, it's sort of a meaning-based image. So it need not necessarily be image in the sense of picture, but some form of concept or construct. Uh, however, there is a ま、<音楽><音楽><音楽> だちだでで、軍団が総、ワンジョ総、だちで、とばらんべ、なんで、ちびよ。そうですね。だちだかな、あんだでんじょうよてべて、え、軍団が総でだ、ワンジョ総にもてかでじょうでんべ、そう。だ
uh, a shape that in fact there is uh, a recognition that in fact it will, for example, if the object of the meditation is fire, one can almost burn and use like a real fire. So, um, so there is a virgin sorcery. It's like casinos in the Pali. I don't know. Pali, sorry. In the Pali, casinos, the use of casinos. Oh, Devices, yeah. It's taking the con conceptual quintessence of an, of an element, such as, or, uh, such as fire, or it could be another element as well, and so generating it meditatively that you can actually superimpose it or, uh, or uh, project it out into, this, into the sensory world. So His Holiness was saying that it is on the basis of this complex understanding of the various levels at which, long, at which imagery can be trained, and that uh, the, the types of practices that uh, Matthew pointed out, which is part of a a Vajrayana practice where we talk of generation stage. That is, uh, um, that's why that practice is based. Shiva Shiva Shiva. No. Shiva in Chijalia, Shiva the Tambachan, the Kana Tambe, then Yoga. Has a Shiva in the Tanjan Yoga or something, the Namana. Sukhai <laughs> This is, um, um, <laughs> you know, listening to the uh, discussion on the, the problematics of pure consciousness or pure awareness. His Holmes was saying that it triggered something um, in his mind which is probably more relevant to the discussion within the Buddhist, however, um, which is that His Holiness has uh, felt for quite a while that um, and there is a reference to uh, phenomena like pure awareness and which, which is sometimes described as the clear light state of mind, the subtle most state of mind, which becomes manifest at the moment of very moment of death. And uh, that uh, uh, it, you know carries on in the life after in the intermediate state from the Buddhist point of view. However, uh, his holiness feels that uh, even in such a you know most subtle uh, states of consciousness, um, that state, um, uh, that me uh, mental state, must have some physical base, regardless of how subtle it may be. Because sometimes there is a tendency among the Buddhists when we think of these very subtle states of consciousness as if they are baseless, as if there is no embodiment, as if there is no, uh, uh, you know, material basis for them. Did scientists and shiver level temperatures, then level temperature you want to say the chikuri. So in a way, this is, you know, in spirit, very similar to the basic scientific standpoint, which is that, uh, you know, brain is the basis for all cognitive events. <laughs> uh, without the brain, uh, that could not function of mind. So similarly, on subtle way, without that base, so-called consciousness, no matter how subtle, I don't know whether something independent or not, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Marlene, you, you had had a question about, picking up on this, you had had a question about what happens, what should we do when brain science, when the data of brain science and the data of introspection disagree? Um, I think the question was a little more general than that, and that has to do with uh, the material foundation, the material basis of visual mental imagery. Um, as we saw in the um, slide presentation, there appear to be many regions of the brain which are active during the course of perception, and it's a subset of those same regions that are activated <coughs> during visual mental imagery. So it really looks like it's an sort of elegant design property of the brain that you can get two processes out of the same underlying substrate. Um, 
we don't have a whole lot of brain tissue, and so it makes a lot of sense to have perception seeing in the world and imagery seeing in the mind's eye use the same underlying mechanism. The one empirical question that comes to mind for me, um, as we saw in the data, there seems to be a rather small region of imagery, a rather sort of minimal subset or smaller subset of brain regions that are activated in imagery compared to perception. And the question that I have is whether or not contemplative practitioners who are very advanced are perhaps recruiting some of these additional perception areas to subserve this very sophisticated and refined visual mental imagery. It seems a immediately testable hypothesis. Okay. I think the question was the question goes like this. I think if with experience in practice your images get better and better, as you said, does that change the brain? Does it result in more of the areas that are not recruited by imagery but are recruited by perception? now being recruited by imagery. Is that what you wanted? Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, what is the substrate Does meditation the improve your brain? But that's an experiment. You have to look. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> it's not us. Alan, you want to jump? For all of the 2,500 years that Buddhists have been intensely interested in the nature of the mind, there really is no compelling Buddhist theory of the brain. It does, as, as you were saying, brain mechanisms are not revealed by introspection. And I think the 2,500 years of the Buddhist tradition would probably corroborate that assertion. So the answer is we don't know. ドランクドネ、ナムシトリアリア、エネ、ミギンシタ、ナムシマト、ナイムシ、ジェムシシャン。ナラミクトリア、え、カソフェオ、オンブシャンアゲ、ムシシェリアリ。デカレスロナ、
And so in, in this Vajrayana or higher class of practice, you're, you're working on, a, on, on two avenues, not only transforming the mind, but also explicitly transforming the energies in the body. This is said then to, to open up uh, other types of uh, heightened, heightened awareness or exceptional awareness. So in the, in the, the sutra system, there is, um, in, the, in the contemplative text, there is um, a recognition of the possibility of uh, cultivating heightened awareness only, re only in relation to the visual perception and auditory perception, but not to the other senses. Whereas in this Vajrayana... And there is a, and I think a, through modern technology, television, so there's something similar, for example, even in the technology, there's a kind of a limitation. You can project images on the television screen, and you can project sounds and through the radio waves. But uh, as far as smell and tactile sensation mm -hmm. is concerned, you still cannot transport them. So there's a, something similar in the Buddhist text as well. But in the Vajrayana uh, tradition, given that there is an emphasis both on the mind and also the basis of the mind, which are the energy, um, um, part of the body energies, um, there is the energy level. And the, the primary locus of the energy is thought to be in the head. So given that in these texts there is an understanding that as the yogis, advanced yogis, gain greater mastery over these physiological elements, then uh, it would be possible for advanced yogis to be able to utilize those bodily energies that are normally kind of uh, uh, confined to the function of specific sensory faculties can actually be co-opted and transferred for example, like a, a yogi would be able to close his eyes and read a text with his fingers through the sensation of touch. There are such claims which suggest the possibility of transferring a different uh, basis. Well, we do know if, if you're blind, your visual cortex will be activated when you read Braille. Yeah. So the brain has reorganized. <laughs> So it's, yeah, maybe, but it's, his holiness was saying that it's not through touch that one reads uh, here. Well, there may be more to discuss on that one. There is. Um, just a, so the one tip of the iceberg. Ah. I, I, uh, yes, just, on the... yeah, just to actually answer, <laughs> because you know, I, I was not, I was puzzled about how we could look at uh, uh, the media could actually look at what changed in the brain. But what we would predict is someone who has this faculty of stable and vivid imagery, that at the time is engaged in that practice with stability and clarity, and definitely there should be something uh, either stable or clear or enhanced in the corresponding part of the brain. That's for sure. We could predict that. It's a short one. I want to bring in some of these. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question eventually. Okay. Yeah. I think we're going to bring in some other questions, slightly shift gears. Actually, I'd like to follow up on I what Matthew pardon. just said. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I, I, I think it's useful. It's one of the goals of this conference to try to come up with empirically testable hypotheses. And I think the one you just suggested is a great idea. If it's really true that after training that you can hang on to an image for longer, Indeed, you would expect to be able to pick that up in some way or other yes, sure. in the brain or otherwise. Yes. But just to just more more generally, in addition to that, it seems to me there are a whole host of testable hypotheses that are floating around here, and I, and I thought it'd be useful to just kind of list some of them. So it seems to me, the, the, especially centering around uh, training of imagery and training of attention. So it seems to me the first thing that would be important to do is to behaviorally test um, people who've had extensive training to see if we can pick up behavioral signatures of these claims, right? So for example, um, improved mental imagery could take many different uh, forms. They could be able to hold on images longer, as, as just mentioned. 
the um, people with such training might be able to um, imagine more, uh, more items at once. You might be able to test this by testing, say, um, short-term visual memory, say, present a uh, complicated um, image with variable numbers of uh, elements in it, and test a very brief moment later, uh, how good is that short-term visual memory? <laughs> Do you have more? Okay, so so we can test the um, the duration, the capacity. Um, uh, so all of these kinds of behavioral measures should be done first. It seems to me on those with extensive training. Can I yeah, go ahead. A, I have a question: um, When you train your imagery, does it generalize? That is, if you train on certain deities, can you later have the same imagery ability with other sorts of things you did not train on? No. No. Normally it should, yes, because the, the stability and the clarity is general. I mean, for instance, when his honest give the initiation of the Kalak Chakra, he has to go, I, I mentioned, 720 something deities. And I've personally seen someone in Tibet who was looking at the frescoes and he was checking the accuracy of the drawing. And there was about 200 deities. And he was simply looking and looking at sort of reviving them in their mind. He said, oh, here there's a mistake. He's holding the wrong thing in the right hand. <laughs> and I've seen that he, he was a retreatant and he was also a painter. And he had been and come down to check the frescoes. And it was quite amazing that he was looking at each of them as if, you know, it was so familiar in his mind that he could see it in his own mind and check if it was the same. Yeah. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, it's certainly applied at least to other types of uh, deities which are you know, not that different. So I don't know whether that will help for, for instance, your island with all the small houses and beach. I have no idea. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but the, reason, the reason I ask specifically is, is I'm, I'm looking oh, for man. experiments that will disprove my theory. Yeah. So according to my theory, <laughs> the training should be very specific. <laughs> See, can you say that again? According oh. to his theory, go ahead. I think that's important. Yes. Your do you theory, say Stephen? Yeah, I, I think it's the point of contact between your tradition and our tradition is most interesting when we find cases where you've made proposals or claims that contradict what we would predict or expect based on our theories. Mm -hmm. So maintaining images for 20 minutes or 24 hours, definitely. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also a subtle thing, it, it, that is I would expect training to be very specific. If you get good at visualizing these deities, may not affect other deities, okay. let alone a rabbit. Things have to be a little bit more common, huh? What? <laughs> In fact, uh, according to the, uh, the, the text on visualization, um, it is recommended to the practitioners at the beginner's level not to shift focuses. So initially, you have to stick with one set of imagery when you are cultivating it. But once you have gained a certain mastery, then you will have a, a flexibility to be able to shift to to redirect your focus. But initially, one is advised to remain focused. I suspect it's also somewhat more complex than this. For example, even within med uh, mental imagery, you may, one of the techniques is to visualize something very simple, like simply a pearl of light. A simple white pearl of light. Focus on that, do nothing else. You may develop great stability there and great vi vividness there. And so let's imagine you become adept at focusing on a single pearl of light. And then you go to Matthew, the teacher, and he says, all right, here's 720 deities. Go for it. <laughs> uh, I don't think that you're going to find that you can visualize immediately 720 deities of the same clarity that you could do the single visualization of light. You'll have a head start. But because it's a much more complicated feat, then it's going to take you some time to get into that gear. Now, there's a wide variety of techniques for stabilizing, it, the, stabilizing and refining the attention. Uh, some entail a mental image, but for example, also focusing on the breath. Well, if you've gotten very good at the focusing the breath, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be immediately extremely good at creating mental imagery. 
Or you're asking about pure awareness. Now, even there, there are relative and more ultimate stages of, 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 pure, of empty awareness, so to speak. Um, right now, you can be aware that you are aware. Without particularly attending to any of the objects of awareness, you can simply see, sit there and be immediately aware, aware of being aware. Can you not? You don't have to get that by inference, do you? No. So there is a case of attending to something, but you can say, well, what image came to mind when you were simply focusing on being aware of being aware? Now, other stuff is coming in, but now let's, let's go to a thought experiment. Imagine you've got the knack of that. You know what it's like, even though there's a lot of stimuli coming in. And now we slip you into a sensory, sensory deprivation tank. And now let's imagine your mind goes very quiet, that there's there, for, at least for an interlude, there are no images coming to mind. But you haven't fallen asleep. You haven't gone dopey. The mind is perfectly clear. It's very stable, but you have, a, let's imagine in a, a pure case, you have not, no sensory experience of your environment whatsoever, but you're not unconscious. That would be a facsimile of pure awareness, where you are aware of being aware, and just in there, there's something there that's now very hard to articulate, but I think you may be able to imagine it. And that is one way to develop shamatha, to develop, excuse me, to refine the attention to a very high level. But you would be having thoughts in that situation. And then wouldn't you, you would be having thoughts in that situation. And then when, wouldn't you be aware of the thoughts? When, of course you are. But as you... And then what's pure about it? <laughs> oh, in the beginning, of course, thoughts are compulsive. They keep on coming just by sheer ha habit. But as you become more adept in this practice, the density of these thoughts, thoughts starts to thin out. The interludes between them starts to expand. And you have longer and longer moments, three seconds and 30 seconds and 30 minutes, in which you have maintained or even enhanced the quality of clarity of awareness, but you're vividly aware of not much at all. In your, your talk, you emphasized that meaning was always sort of bound to images. That was one of the points of it. There is something called reality monitoring, monitoring, where it turns out that people confuse their images for actually having seen something. Mm. So if I ask you to visualize objects, and I show you objects, and then later ask you to select which objects you actually were shown versus which ones you visualized, you make mistakes. You, it's not a surprise, given the, the brain information. Um, so at first I started wondering, I started worrying, if your images got more and more vivid, would you be more prone to mistaking having visualized something or having seen something? But if I've understood properly, because you always have a meaning attached to the image and your awareness is improving, you overcome that problem. Is that correct? You're able to have increasingly vivid images without confusing them for reality? because of the meaning and the awareness attached to the image? Is that the idea? Or, do, or is there a flip side where people actually do get confused about what they visualized and what they, they've seen as they practice more? Um, I don't know about confusing, but one describes a state of ultimate capacity of visualizing where it, it does arise as a real thing without mental effort. So, but you know, it's very hard to say. I mean, I have no experience of that, so I cannot say whether there's an element of confusion, but it doesn't, I don't see what, uh, yeah. I think it could happen. No. It could happen, yes. It could happen. But the, the question is with training, as your image gets more vivid, we know that people with more vivid imagery are more prone to this problem mm -hmm. of confusing, it could happen. visualizing, or having seen. Yeah, we say ultimately it seems as if it is real. Right, so but the question is, is part of the training with the meaning component to avoid that problem? That as you become aware increasingly of what is your image and what is the world, is that part of what you're training to do? Or is it? We try to avoid solidifying mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. something, you know, which is really, uh, again, solid as we normally perceive solid reality. So that's why at, at the end of every training of visualization, you are going to dissolve the visualization in, oh, in clear light so that precisely to avoid danger of clinging to it as something solid. Uh -huh. 
That's so that's a very important yeah. step of fusion is to dissolve it so that you don't cling it. And there is a, a story, I don't know whether it's true or not, but of a meditator that was so engaged in just visualizing without that dissolving problem that he was visualizing a deity which has some kind of horn because it has an animal head. At one point he said he could not get out of his hermitage because the horns were preventing him. <laughs> so <laughs> it's to give us as an example yeah. of someone who is, it's, it's a deviation of visualization because you are again solidifying the phenomenal world through your visualization rather than visualization helping you to see the whole phenomenal world as something appearing yet void as a rainbow and that's one of the goals. It's not to cling to reality as being solid. Dan has been waiting patiently. Um, I'd actually like to shift our focus a little bit, if I might, and return to what I think is a very important question that His Holiness raised earlier. Um, when the question came up, I thought I knew the answer, but as our conversation has progressed, I'm less and less certain I know the answer, so let me see if I can voice my confusion. Um, the question was whether there are people who, in some important way, lack the capacity for visualization, whether because of eyeglasses or some such. And holding the issue of eyeglasses to the side, one of the things that psychology has wrestled with for the last hundred years or more is that if you simply talk to people, I mean untrained people, ordinary people, about their imagery experience, you get an ex extraordinary diversity of reports with some people who spontaneously report images that um, make it sound like they're looking at detailed, vivid, very clear pictures, and then people who are at the other extreme who will insist that they have never in their lives had anything that they could legitimately count as a mental picture. Now, psychologists are uncertain what to make of this, and I suspect across this panel of psychologists you might get several different interpretations of this observation, but the observation itself is quite clear-cut, and my first take on this was that I would think that not being able to visualize would be a significant disadvantage for anyone entering contemplative training because they would be lacking one of the tools that they need in order to make progress. But then as the conversation has proceeded, and I've heard you discuss what one achieves after one has learned to visualize and one starts moving toward these quintessences, these purer forms, um, I mean, it almost sounds to me like these poor souls who lack visual imagery um, actually have a head start. <laughs> it sounds to me like they can proceed immediately to step two and have these quintessences without the distraction of all the visual forms. And I'm curious to know whether that latter way of thinking makes sense at all from your understanding of training or whether we need to be more detailed about what these individuals lack. And I should say parenthetically, I am one of these individuals. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would like to believe that there are certain advantages associated with this day. <laughs> Any comments um, from the Buddhists or His Holiness? <laughs> 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 で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、
You want to do Okay. Um, His Holiness returns to the, uh, actually it's right on the vein of what you're raising here. His Holiness returns to the training of the attention in which you're not focusing on a mental image so much as rather simply focusing on right the very nature of awareness itself. Now there's a technique for that. And that as you're, as you're abiding in the present, you leave your attention hovering right in the, imme- the immediacy of the present moment and you, you block out, you know, with, with effort, you block out any recollections and obviously thoughts pertaining to the past and similarly you block out any anticipation or imaginations and so forth about the future and you remain right there in the moment. And again, it's a, it's, this is a strenuous practice to abide there in the immediate, immediacy of the present without letting your mind fragment either, the, either to the past or the, or the future. Now, as you venture into this practice, uh, there's going to be a fair amount of competition in your awareness, that is, you're getting stimuli from the various senses, visual, auditory, and so forth. But as you become more adept at this practice, then you may have times when you are simply abiding quite purely. Your attention is really quite focused in just the nature of being aware right in the moment. And over time, you might have a half minute, a minute in which that's all that is appearing to your mind. It's just being aware itself. And the salient features of awareness in the Buddhist tradition in Tibetan Sejing Rikpa, which is a sheer quality of luminosity or clarity and of cognizance, a, 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 ex- the experience of knowing, of cognizing as an event that's going on and on and on. And so for a half, mo- for a half minute, for a minute, you may so, so focus in that that these salient features, these defining characteristics of awareness itself are all that manifest. And this is something that, for at least for a half a minute, a minute, are something that, something that uh, could be accessible to, to an ordinary person. This is not an extremely advanced stage of meditative experience. Well, I mean, it's, uh, surely I'm misunderstanding, but it sounds like someone who is um, dysfunctional as I am um, and therefore not distracted by the sensory experiences um, is already well on the road and therefore <laughs> Should be that much calmer, that much centered, um, and so on. Those in the room who know me know this is, of course, absolutely counterfactual. um, And makes me think that I'm not quite sure I'm understanding what it is one needs to subtract away in order to reach what I'll loosely call this next stage. Well, you know, there's an element of clarity which we don't have usually when we simply stay in sort of ordinary state without you know, without imagery and just, you know, whatever comes, goes. But this is it definitely yeah. lacks this clarity. When we, when we speak of yeah. pure awareness, there's a much increased element of what we call luminosity or clarity, which is extreme vividness, extreme presence. And this is not, as, uh, this is not something that we normally experience in ordinary time, because even you don't notice, there's always a lot of thoughts and perception that yeah. comes. We give the example of in a meadow, you know, you may not see the water that is running under the grass, but it's always a lot of noise mm-hmm. and sort of things go happening in the mind. Yeah. But pure awareness, it is not, it is not like that. It's, it's a sheer clarity, but there's no element of either distraction or torpor or sort of uh, oblivion or something like that. So the element of clarity is normally missing in an ordinary dull experience, even we don't have images. So there's still some effort to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can I try asking a version of that question one more time? Because I'm, what do monks who enter into a monastery and turn out to have poor visualization, what, what do they, what, what, what do you do for them? Send well, this precisely, send, I mean, is there a, as, I, as I mentioned, so, so we are talking about mental imagery, so I, I thought I have to say a few words about that. But it's really one of the many methods. We even speak of 84,000 ways of getting onto the spiritual transformation. So that is a very powerful one, but it's certainly not the only one. We're going to shift gears, unless you wanted to... um, We're going to shift gears in just a moment and begin to open up uh, to some of the questions from the audience. But before we do, I thought it would be nice if we did another version of the reciprocal exchange that we had in in the first session, because the science side has posed some questions some hypotheses that they would like to see uh, potentially brought into a laboratory, but what do you fellows think? <laughs> Ada, Alan, as well, I... It's not, it's not what I think, it's what I, I'm asking a question. What, what, would be a, what would you like to see studied? What, would, what do you think is important, particularly in this issue of imagery? 
Well, I have a question, first of all. Uh, with regards to the hypothesis that mental images are not, are, are, do not happen instant, ins instantaneously, but are generated sequentially, uh, His Holiness already raised the issue of dream imagery. There's another one right on that borderline between sleep, uh, b between waking and sleeping, hyp hypnagogic imagery. In some cases, they may, may be so vivid, it's as if you're really watching a movie in a movie theater. I mean, it is radiantly clear. And it may be multimodal. That is, uh, in one image that I had, I was in this hypnagogic imagery, I was mentally seeing a brook, but I was also hearing it. And I could feel the wind blowing through the grass on the side of the, the, the brook. And so it was stable, it was extremely lucid, and that it would be kind of like a preface to the dream state, and dreams, as you know, can go on for 45 minutes at a time. And so the type of clarity that we have both in hypnagogic imagery as well as dream imagery, do you think this is in principle inaccessible during the waking state? Hmm. That's one question, and the corollary question is, do you think that's also, gen that is when I was seeing that brook, was I generating it drop by drop or, you know, frame by frame? Or was that not more like visual imagery of just seeing a brook? Certainly from a first person perspective, that seemed like I was mentally seeing a brook. I omitted a lot of funnies that are out there, so your, your intuitions are exactly right. There is a lot of reports, there are a lot of reports of dynamic imagery in some studies, although it's understudied, or not very many of them. But it is definitely the case that objects and images move, mm -hmm. as do real objects, and in fact they engage motor cortex, and parts of cortex are involved in tracking motion. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been studied in the scanner. In fact, I think Nancy Kanwisher did some of that implied motion work. Um, but the, I think these are all different states, and it's not clear to me that one's a necessary prerequisite for the other, or even that they overlap a whole lot. So you saw that spatial imagery, color imagery, and shape draw in different parts of the brain. I, um, it would take me a couple of minutes to talk about dreaming, and I've got Bob Stickwold out there somewhere. I noticed he's a real expert, so I have to be careful. Um, but dreaming, I think, is a sequence of images. I don't think it's, you're not maintaining one image. Quite so. It's very fragmented. Quite and the reason for that is that usually our images are tied with action. Mm -hmm. Our images actually prepare us for moving. And dreaming, of course, you don't want to move. You turned off those parts of the brain. So you get parts of visual cortex that are sort of later downstream activated, but not the very earliest. And it looks like there's a lot of fragmentation and changing. It doesn't look like, at least in the scanner, waking imagery. It doesn't look very much like it. The question here, the hypothesis from the Buddhist side is that if you develop, train the attention in stability and vividness by way of a mental image, it can get to the point when you become an adept that you can see it mentally with more or less the same degree of clarity, mm -hmm. vividness, as you could as if you were seeing it with the eyes. That's the hypothesis. True or false, that's it. Uh, but during a dream state, we do see things with the clarity as if we were seeing in the eyes, at least on some occasions. And so my question is, since, unless I'm wrong here, but it seems like there is extraordinary clarity in some dreams, the, obviously the most vivid ones, is that degree of clarity, is that, in your understanding, in principle inaccessible during the waking state, in terms of mental images? Buddhism would say, no, it's not, not in principle inaccessible. Do you disagree? First of all, I'm not sure I take at face value the introspections. I suspect people differ markedly in their reports of how clear those images are. Second, even if they do agree, or even one person is consistent over time, I'd want to know which of the three categories of introspection in relation to mechanism that those reports fall in. Is it really the case that when you claim to have or experience these very vivid Images during dreams, they reflect an underlying state of the mechanism very much like what occurs during vivid perception. That's an empirical question. Mm -hmm. um, third, sec, finally, even if it were true, I, I would predict that you could not carry that over into waking perception. So I guess another mm -hmm. point of contact yeah. that you make a prediction that I would say, I don't, I don't think so, there's too much interference mm -hmm. when you're awake. The brain is in a different mode. Different transmitter systems are activated. It's really quite different waking and sleeping. Yeah. Well, that stage of sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew? Yes, I think among the things that would be, seems to me interesting to test is to which extent a clear visualization would compete with a clear perception of something that is presented to you. Uh, because uh, it's, it would seem that, at least for images that are transforming or appearing, not just something static, uh, that if you are to the extent that your vision is extremely clear, you may not be able to actually see you know, something that appears and read it or describe it to the same extent. And if you start attending to this, it might be more difficult to maintain the visualization. And it seems to us that if we do have a very clear visualization, you certainly perceive the global 
uh, field of vision with the different colors and shape, but you are not actually attending to the details and identification of those. So that could be something that maybe could be sort of tested. It was first done in 1910, sorry. Marlene likes to. I was just going to comment that there are now very well established laboratory paradigms that have attempted to lay out the potential interference between imagery and perception. It seems so um, obvious that we should be using these kinds of paradigms, which appear to be really robust and sort of scientifically tractable to evaluate this kind of question. Great. It's a really exciting idea. Uh, Why don't we stop on that? I'm oh, sorry, Nancy. One very brief note on that. You can also look, uh, for example, in one study in my lab, we looked at uh, mental imagery in a scanner, and we showed much like Steve's data, but looking at very specific parts of the brain that respond to very specific kinds of, um, of images, um, actual percepts, right? So one region that responds very selectively when you look at faces, and another region that responds very selectively when you look at uh, scenes. We then had people close their eyes and imagine faces or scenes, and we showed selective activation of the corresponding brain areas. So, but we also looked at the magnitude of the activation in those areas, and it was roughly half as strong in mental imagery as in actual perception. And you might imagine that that ratio, that percentage of activation would be stronger after training. So there's work to be done. Huh? I think this we wanted to make a bit of time now to open up the discussion to some questions from the audience. And Arthur, I think, has a small handful right. of questions. There are quite a number of questions which came from people who are concerned about the benefits mm -hmm. of mental imagery beyond what one might call the uh, purely psychological or spiritual benefits of which you spoke of. So, for example, uh, there's a, a tradition now which basically believes that mental imagery, imagining certain kinds of things, can have a benefit for even the curing of disease or the controlling of pain. Uh, there are certain psychological benefits which might enhance creativity, for example, one could ask. Uh, memory functions. Uh, there was also a question concerning schizophrenia, but all of these have to do with what we might call you know, psychological improvements or even physical bodily improvements at the hand of mental imagery. Mm -hmm. So I think, just if you were, no, we have been exchanging things with Stephen about that, but so as a preliminary, I'll just describe a few uh, techniques that are used precisely as application of mental imagery to either uh, alleviate pain or to increase uh, sort of uh, positive emotions like compassion. So for pain, for instance, there's a a well-known sort of type of medication that if someone has a very painful physical pain in one spot, one will use mental imagery, imagining, for instance, uh, possibly a Buddha, for instance, being there, radiating light, and that light also uh, comes like an, a nectar, which is at the same time luminous and soothing, and uh, which has a pleasing orange color, and that pervades completely, soaks the, the, place where, the place where there is pain. And if you do that again and again, and it sort of radiates and sort of pervades your whole body, and doing this again and again is known to help to alleviate the feeling of pain, and it's, the, it's, it's used, regularly used by people who are both meditators and uh, have acute physical pain, and they find strong benefits from that. And then another way to use mental imagery to enhance one's positive emotions is, for instance, to with something what we call the exchange of happiness and suffering. You will use your breathing, which is the most natural function we have. And so when you breathe in, you will think that you are gathering like a, like a black cloud all the suffering and pains of all sentient beings. And you are clearly visualizing like you are, you are sort of drawing those, like a smoke or like a cloud and absorbing it in yourself, in your heart, which again you visualize as a bright last, a mass of white light. And it completely dissolves into that. And so in that time you visualize that you, all the sufferings of sentient beings are being dissolved. And as you breathe out, then you breathe all your loving kindness, compassion, whatever happiness you might have, and then that all sentient beings get it totally, not like you cut a piece of cake and distribute it, but every sentient being get it whole. And you do it again and again. And when we say riding on the breath, that means it's, you keep on doing it just as naturally as you breathe in and out. So that's a, it's a 
it's a visualization that really completely transforms your mind in terms of, uh, of the concept of happiness and suffering, generating compassion. And because it's linked with the bread, it's something that really helps to transform your mind towards compassion. So this is an application of mental imagery. And you do it, and you have all sorts of variations. You might think of your body transforming is whatever the beings might need. Those who need food, you become food. Those who need clothes for fighting from the cold, you become the clothes. And everywhere in the world, whatever is needed, your body transforms. So this is actually mental imagery, but the goal is to really open your mind and uh, increase your loving case and compassion. So those are types, we find many of those uh, use of mental imagery to actually affect that transformation which we are looking for. I think the question was also directed towards the scientists. That is to say, uh, the questioners were wondering, uh, the, the Buddhists may present certain kinds of practices and out of their own experience believe and, and have the conviction that these are a benefit, say, to relieving pain or even perhaps helping with certain kinds of illnesses. Is there space within your view and understanding of the mind and its relationship to the body to accommodate this? Steve? Say a little something, Stephen, or others. It's something I call the reality simulation principle, which is based on the idea that so much neural real estate is shared by imagery and perception, which says most effects that can occur by interacting with an object in the world can be mimicked by interacting with objects and images, and mental images. So we know that looking at an object, you can remember it better than if you just hear its word. Well, if you visualize the object, you'll remember it about twice as well as just looking at the word. So th these are studies that go back hundreds of years. You could double your memory ability by using imagery. Mm -hmm. um, mental practice, that's a more complicated literature, but there's a, something called a meta-analysis where they looked at all the studies, which suggests that by rehearsing certain behaviors, you will actually get better at doing those behaviors. Um, the whole, the list that you read, I think virtually all of them. So but isn't there studies that uh, for pain control, and all what is tried distraction or the mental imagery is the most efficient? That's correct. There have been meta-analyses meta of all the studies of psychologically based pain control and mental imagery is the best in every case. That's right. Uh, There's also, I mean, an ample research literature on the role of visualization techniques in creative problem solving. And what's quite striking in that literature is that there are things that you can do with imagery and things that you cannot, so that there are, for example, very interesting studies of um, practicing professional architects and looking at what sorts of problems they solve by visualizing the plan they are trying to um, build and, I mean, doing it without picking up pencil, and then what other kinds of problems um, seem to demand that they pick up a pencil and start drawing things out. And it, it turns out that there's some aspects of the problem in each category. So it's not just a simple equation of imagery helps creativity. It does in some very important regards, but not in all regards. Alan? I'd like to add just a corollary to the, the practice that Matthew just described in brief, and that is, His Holiness was asked yesterday, how can we possibly experience compassion for, an, for a person who engages in evil, especially if this very harmful behavior is directed towards ourselves. And His Holiness addressed this, pointing out that the person who engages in the evil is him or herself subject to mental afflictions, to hatred, to delusion, to greed, and so forth. And it's because of the person being dominated by the mental afflictions that this very harmful behavior is being expressed. And so a practice of imagination or visualization would be attending to such a person and imagining that person, like a doctor imagining a patient without the illness that the person, person is presently succumbed to, imagine that person free of the illness, and then wishing, visualizing this person be free of these mental afflictions, may it be so. And then one may engage in this practice that Matthew just described. But being able to differentiate between the person and the evil the person has immersed him herself in because of mental afflictions. So this is a rather mm, demanding mm -hmm. a challenge to imagination as well. Arthur, do you want to put a few more on the table? Sure. Here's another one that's a kind of a challenge. Um, it says, imagine that uh, brain imaging study found that brain activation of trained practitioners showed precisely the same pattern of quickly fading brain activity following imagery as <laughs> untrained people. In other words, there was no change, no difference. You, 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 you reported through self-report that you could do it for 24 hours or even 20 minutes, right? But uh, it actually turned out it was just like everybody else. 
Would this cause you to question the reality of sustained images? Wow. Ooh, great That's question. A... I'll jump in. Alan wants to jump in. Okay. I don't know which side to start with first. I see Nancy's <laughs> hand over there as well. Do you want to? If the brain activity is the same as normal start. people, then would the, you when you question the report. I would say first that, um, first of all, failing to see a difference in a brain imaging study um, is not very informative at all and wouldn't worry me about anything. It's, <laughs> it's the most common outcome of any brain imaging study you do. <laughs> True. Unfortunately. Yes. Uh. So, and there are many ways to not see a difference in the brain that's actually there. So this is sort of a picky point, but if you don't get a difference, it's not very worrisome. However, I think if you did the behavioral experiments that we were starting to sketch before, and you not, did not see any differences, mm -hmm. then I would start to worry. Okay. What, what's the difference? I mean, why, are you, why is, more, why is there more reliability on the behavioral experiment? Because the claims are that mental imagery ability is improving, and the relationship of that to the brain is unknown. But if mental imagery ability is improving, let's see it improve with a behavioral test, which is very close to the claim, right? Okay. Great. Well, from the empirical side or experience side of the practitioner, I would say that, you know, we should not forget again that the goal of mental imagery is eventually to help you, you know, have a different perception of the phenomenal world and of the way the, the mind works, and eventually getting uh, some kind of inner freedom from obscuring emotions. So if through certain practice, you achieve a progress in that, and after some months or years, you see that that's true. You are no more, not that much prone to anger or jealousy and so forth. So I guess from that perspective, it's something that is so quite obvious uh, in your behavior, uh, or for you, uh, to yourself, and you will not worry too much if you don't see that in the brain. Alan? Briefly, the training of the attention is not something done in total isolation. That is, it's, it's not just training the attention as if it were some utterly independent function of the mind. The training of the attention also, as Matthew at least is implying here, is goes right together with and is deep, deeply in, enmeshed with uh, balancing the emotions, developing greater emotional balance, less anger, less, less uh, emotional oscillations being, between craving and hostility, excessive hope and excessive fear, uh, elation and depression. There's an, this is an overall balancing of the mind in which there is attentional balance, there's emotional balance, but there's also cognitive balance, and this pertains to what you were asking about before, if one gets in very strongly into mental imagery, where you start conflating your imagination with what's happening here. And that kind of training, what I would call cognitive balance, is really a prerequisite for this more advanced training that Matthew was talking about, where you're of this, this stage of generation or this Vajrayana practice, of just honing the mindfulness and clarity of attention so that you are seeing accurately what is there. That is, you're not in a deficit mode of not even getting what's being presented to you, but you're also not in a how do you say, a projecting mode where you can't even distinguish what you're superimposing upon reality, hearing things that were never said. Uh, twice today I've been quoted for things I never said. And so people heard things out of my mouth that never came out of my mouth, which means they came from someplace else. And that's called, a, in my terminology, a cognitive hyperactivity disorder. <laughs> Marlene? Cat. Yeah, I'm returning to the point that Nancy had made earlier about uh, differences <coughs> in brain activity compared to differences in uh, behavioral performance. So there is still one claim that's made by um, contemplative uh, virtuosos, and that is that uh, imagery emerges like a fish out of water, all of a piece. And we haven't really delved into this much further. That seems really perplexing from a scientific perspective, a Western scientific perspective, and seems to me that, um, again, it's an immediately testable hypothesis without going into some of these much more murky issues about uh, advanced thought and pure awareness, um, but something that lends itself very immediately and obviously to uh, laboratory testing. So, but that's true. We know the problem with uh, having to talk about those things is uh, uh, especially when you go to advanced stages of meditation. This is something that we find again and again in the description of contemplative. But I wish I could see those visualizations like a fish leaping out of water. Mm -hmm. So I'm not the right subject for that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Your Holiness, did you want to say something? You've been talking quietly with Jimpa, and I wondered if you wanted to say anything to the group. I did think about that. 
che non l'ha dato su di a. Se ti sono messo in un giorno, 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 se ti sono messo in で、レベルの言うべらいで、セーブロボタ。え。た。え。でも、た、日本のあれやちゃちゃな。し、え、テミンジュにも、コンドサルでテミンにもちゃでろだ。た、んで、え、知るにも、ちゃんき。たわしと
And then there are others which are really grounded in very deep principles, symmetry principles, conservation laws, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it would be a real violence to the theory to, to, to make that change at the hand of data. And the data has to be very compelling. Uh, first of all, what would it mean for your theory to, if we were to do some of these experiments? Uh, and at what level would the transformations need to be mm -hmm. undertaken? If the, um, the answer to the first part is definitely yes. I've actually already started collaborating, uh, testing uh, monks, but it's, it's proving difficult to find the right sort of practitioner who has the kind of expertise in imagery. It's not quite as easy as we thought it was going to be. So we have yes, set up experiments to test. To, it, speak up just a little bit, Stephen. We've, we've already set up the experiments to test the ability to hold on to images over time and how vivid they are and the effects of different kinds of emotions on how easily you can hold images. Uh, those experiments are set up and ready to go. Um, so we're waiting to see if we can find someone who will collaborate on that. Um, and it really depends on how the results come out and furthermore, what they reflect. So once there is a behavioral result, we would then scan them while they do it if they would agree with the object of trying to discover exactly what the mechanism is doing differently. And that would really depend. Um, but my own view is there comes a point where if a theory needs to be patched up right. too much, you just give up and start over again. Mm -hmm. So this might end up being such a case. We have to wait and see how it comes out. And I think this opportunity to be in a position of being able to wait to see how it comes out could really lead to something quite new, for, at least for science. Thank you. I, I think on that note, it's 4 o'clock, and I'm on a strict timetable here. And so I think you'll join me in thanking panelists. Oh, thank you.